Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. Now, in the run-up to Children's Day this month, we thought it's appropriate to do a masterclass on how to plan for your child's future, his or her financial goals like education and marriage, but more importantly, how to imbibe the quality of financial awareness and literacy to your child at a young age. Joining me now is Vivek Bajaj. He's a very popular face on social media, so he needs no introduction, perhaps. Vivek has been a learner of the financial markets for the last 17 years. He's also co founded various businesses and is an active social media contributor with over a million followers. He's also the founder of Credit Info Edge, an enterprise involved in simplifying finance. And for the last five years, he's been involved in empowering people with right learning and analytics in finance through his online ventures, elearnmarkets.com and StockEdge. Vivek, thanks a lot for being with us on the show. It's a pleasure hosting you. Uh, you know, there's so much in this space, right? Because our children, by nature, they don't know anything about money. Um, they don't know how to manage finances, whether you talk about children at an age of five or at an age of 15. So, so much to teach them. But tell us, what is the right age to introduce finance to your child? I think uh, five is a good age. <laughs> and I'm seeing that change in, in my kids. I have three kids. My daughter is 13. My kids, uh, my boys, I have twin boys. They're eight year old. And I'm seeing that uh, distinct uh, need of understanding how the money is operating. You know, but I remember my old age, I mean, when younger days, when I was 18, 19, we were not thinking about money so much. You know, we were always there uh, considering ourselves to be entitled kids of our father figures, that they were taking care of things. But I, I'm saying in my case, there is a definitely uh, inclination towards learning about money because they want to spend. And the moment they have a requirement of spending, they want to know, sir, Papa, how are you uh, making these monies? How are you helping us to spend that money? So I think five and six is a very good age to start talking about money. Okay, so when you say talking about money, right, uh, what are the good ideas uh, to teach your children about money? I mean, let's talk about that. If you want to introduce financial literacy to your child, how do you do it? And what's your view on pocket money? It's very debatable, uh, you know, when to give pocket money to your child, how much to give. But let's start with financial literacy tools. Yeah. What are the main tools to look at? So, uh, first thing first, we have to talk about money. The whole concept of financial literacy starts when we evolve from barter system to a uh, common denominated money. So the best tool is, you know, our grandmother used to teach us through stories. So the best tool is as parents, we have to start narrating stories about money, about things which we are going through on a daily basis. Talk to your kids and maybe spend 15 minutes at the end of the day that, listen, I bought this and I'm very disappointed that I purchased this. Yeah, I bought this. I'm so excited. To the moment they start uh, valuing the things, not value in terms of uh, moral value, but in terms of pricing the things which we are buying, they start also thinking about the money in that way. Mm. So experience sharing is the first teacher. And then there are, I mean, we are living in this globalized social media world. There is so many content, so much content already. I mean, YouTube is the biggest educator and they know exactly whom to follow, be it Mr. Beast or whoever the big influencers are. They are already making that impact of teaching them about the money. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to understand how important is it to instill a habit of saving mm. uh, in a child and a practical concept of investing. I mean, you said you can start at the age of five. Yeah. But children don't really know the difference between need and want, yeah. right? It's very confusing for them because they seem to want everything. Yeah. Uh, but how important is it to make that distinction very early on? Well, um, you know, the, the whole need and want uh, argument has also evolved. Hmm. Now, today, we, because the overall per capita income has gone up and we all have earned more money, so, I mean, having a, a better car, is it a need or a want? Yeah. For us, it's now a need that we want to travel, we want to have a basic luxury. Kids, they are considering it to be the most obvious thing. If you, if you talk to any kids and, say, and tell him that, uh, you know, uh, we don't have car, and the kid will be like, we don't have car, what's like? Or let's take a very rudimentary example, internet. Yeah. Right? We used to dial in, right? And we used to love that sound of dial in, remember yeah. that sound? <laughs> and now, when you tell kids that internet is not working, the kid will say, what is internet is not working. We don't know this concept of internet not working. Yeah. So I think the whole uh, need and want argument has to be seen in a very different manner. Mm. Let's accept the fact that uh, when we talk to the children, we say, tell them that, and 
Papa used to tell that, why do you need a car? Yeah. And now you can't have the same analogy drawn. You, you have to accept that the basic want which we thought is a want is a need for the child. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, of course, this is a very long drawn topic and I'll come back to it on how to educate your child. But we also want to teach our viewers how to invest money to secure their child's future because it's never too early to start investing for your child, right? So, take us through the basics. If I want to invest money and I have a five-year-old son, if I want to secure his, chi uh, his future, uh, how do I do it? Well, you know, Someone said that you should always start with Excel A1, cell A1. So cell A1 to uh, the complete Excel. First open an Excel sheet and mention the age of your child and draw a 50 year map for the child. You will know that at this age, there will be certain capital requirement, right? And if you have today X capital, and if you know that after 50 years, you will be leaving a legacy of X capital for your child, then you can map that objective that money requirement at a particular age with that requirement. So Excel sheet, everyone should have that Excel sheet. It cannot be that, oh, I know that after five years I'll have this capital requirement, so how do I plan that? No, you draw the Excel sheet. You look at after five years, this is the education expense required. After 15 years, this is an advanced education or a marriage requirement. And you can map individual assets with that specific goal. Okay, you know, since I have a child of five years of age, I took the liberty to make that Excel sheet for you okay. with a child uh, who is five years old. It's just going to come up for you in, in a seconds from now. Uh, so there you have it, right? The child's age is five years and mm. there are about maybe 12, 13 years left to go to college. Taking into consideration inflation, uh, the goal amount, the future value of the goal, so the goal amount, I mean, just go through this table for us. This is a table that you've shared. Sure. If I want a particular goal for my child's education, how much should I put in? Sure. So five year age and I mean, 12 years uh, to go to the college. So I'm sure you are planning for that college thing. Inflation 10% because there are two legs of that inflation. One is uh, the currency uh, depreciation. You have to always consider that you, whatever, even if you are not asking your child to go abroad, in India also, your currency depreciation, depreciation is something which... So 3% is your annualized currency depreciation and long-term inflation, 6 to 7%. Mm. So that's why the inflation rate is 10%. My goal amount is 51,000. And this 51,000, if I'm not wrong, uh, this, this... Oh, this is 5 lakhs. This is Sorry. 5 lakhs. This is, yeah, five, this is lakhs. 5 lakhs. So 5 lakh is my goal amount and the future value is around 15 lakh. So basically considering the inflation, my requirement is 15 lakh okay. after 12 years when the, when the kid goes to the college. Okay, so I have a requirement of 15 lakhs. I mean, this mm. is very basic, right? We yeah. all know that no education will cost you 15 lakhs. It will be a lot more than that. Absolutely. But we're just taking this as a basic amount. Now, if I want to reach this 15 lakh goal, uh, what, are, uh, what do I need to do? How much should I split it? Uh, we've put the different assets there as well. Yeah. Um, how much should be in fixed deposit, how much in mutual fund, how much in stocks? Yeah, so uh, obviously you don't want to put the entire capital in equity because that will have a different risk profile. So what I'm recommending is you should have an FD, no doubt about it. Some people may not like this argument that FD should be there, but it gives comfort. It gives that security to that capital which you have. So you should have an FD uh, equivalent to this amount because it's a, it's a matter of child education. You can't play with that. Then mutual fund, uh, if you see the long-term return, five-year CAGR of a typical mutual fund, it's around 13%, right? So you should park some capital there, which is equivalent to 61,000. And stocks, because I come from stock market, I understand the power of stock market. And a bit of sweetener to enhance your return is required to beat that nasty inflation. So I think 15% return should be expected from stock. So 54,000 is the one which you should expect. But there's a question here, right? Because if I invest for my son now, after 12 years, mm. so much would have changed. This rapid disruption happening year after year. So when you talk about buying stocks, do you buy the blue chip stocks? Do you look at trends? Do you look at themes? How do you decide what stocks to buy? Well, the ideal scenario is that if you are a passive investor, then you look out for stocks where there is a very high chance that those stocks will stay forever. Mm. I'll give you an example. I have a theme called mother stocks, mm. where basically it's like mother stocks having kids, okay? And these stocks are having their own business. It's not a hold co. These companies have their own business. For example, State Bank of India. Mm. For example, Reliance or InfoEdge. These are the companies who are like mother companies. They are doing great in their respective businesses and their kids are doing phenomenal. 
make a basket of 10 stocks or mother stocks and keep on investing in them. If India is growing, if equity market has to grow in India, that is a primary hypothesis, then these mother stocks will give you stability and decent returns. So are these mother stocks, stocks like, uh, you know, are market leaders in their own genre uh, or are they high growth stocks? Are they stocks with low debt? I mean, what are your filters that you look at when you decide what to buy? Well, this is very simple logic. I'm not looking at any filter. I'm looking at companies who have, uh, who are doing good in their respective business. For example, Grasim, mm -hmm. they have business, they have good uh, visibility of the business and they also have subsidiaries or investment in other companies who are doing research reasonably well. So you will be able to identify 10, so I mean, you just YouTube, Vivek Bajaj, Mother Stocks, you'll get the video. I've recorded those 10 stocks, peaceful investment. If you want to be passive, if you want to kind of not invest entirely in mutual fund, because mutual fund has its own plus and minuses, then these mother stocks can be decent return generator for you. Okay, in fact, you know, I wanted to talk about mutual funds a little bit because I get asked these questions a lot. What are the basic mutual funds that I should invest into for my child, you know, for the longer term? So we have a plate that will come up for you. Uh, these are, of course, a set of mutual funds that uh, Vivek has put together for us. It should just show up for you uh, in a bit. Uh, now, there are large cap funds, there are mid cap funds, and small cap funds, right? So if you want to invest for your child's future, uh, take us through this list, Vivek. What made you come out with this list? And the five-year compounded growth is fine. Yeah. That's the past. Yeah. But what do you see as the next five years? Yeah, so that's actually a very important debate. Uh, whenever we talk about list of mutual fund, we always look at the historical return. But technically, you should go deeper inside the mutual yes. fund, see the fund manager track record, see the cost, uh, the management fees which they are charging, and a bit of uh, just a quick glance of the portfolio which they have, which should make you feel comfortable. Mm. It should not be purely return which is driving. So when we have mentioned these, these are not the top performers, but these are the schemes which we believe that it's been decently managed in the past. They have a decent portfolio and they can still do better in the future. Okay. I, I'm of the school of thought who believes that I don't want to be the top performer. Yeah. I want to be a consistent performer. Something so that's that, stable over the next many years. And my question in that is, in your small cap fund list, you have Quant small yeah, cap, which yeah. has done very well. I mean, it's a 22% compounded growth. Yeah. I think they because they do have a lot of exposure to, you know, uh, stocks like, say, in the Adani group, and that's done very well for them. Yeah. But for my child, who's going to perhaps use this money 18 years later, 12 years later, is it a safe bet? Yeah. So we have to understand what are they doing or any such kind of quant funds are doing. They are playing momentum. And we are living in a, as you said, that we are living in a world which is full of disruption. So value investing is an evergreen thing. It will stay forever. But there are many stocks where you'll see momentum coming and momentum going out. How do you invest in those stocks? The only way you can invest is by playing momentum. Adani, classic example. If you are a value investor, you would have not invested. But if you believe in price momentum, you would have invested. So momentum is equivalent to quant. That's why small exposure, because they are the only one right now in the market, apart from various small cases, I would say that a small exposure to these funds is not a bad idea. Okay, we, it's a very interesting conversation and I do want to take it forward, but we have to take a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back and continue our conversation with Vivek Bajaj on how to secure your child's future. Stay tuned. Welcome back, folks. This is a very special episode on Smart Money where we're discussing our children's future as it is uh, it's just 10 days away from Children's Day and we have Vivek Bajaj here. Um, he, of course, has been in the markets for over 17 years and he has three kids of his own, so he knows what he's talking about. Vivek, before the break, you were telling us about the different kind of mutual funds that one can invest into for your child, right? Yeah. So I just want to get that plate up on board because there's a good mix of large cap funds. Uh, these are the funds that Vivek has uh, chosen. Remember, don't go by the past, the historical performance, but going forward as well, these are safe, consistent funds. The mid cap and the small cap funds will also come up for you in a bit. There's Quant, which has done exceptionally well, PGIM as well. And in the small cap list too, you have access small cap, but there's also ETFs, yep. right? Passive investing, uh, your thoughts on that? I think it's a perfect thing to start uh, because that gets you inside the market. You start uh, looking at NAVs, which uh, the concept of NAV is only comprehensible once you invest and ETF allows you 100 rupees, 500 rupees to invest. So the best thing to ask your kid is that you start ETF investing because you will start understanding the instruments uh, behind the ETF. 
So Nifty ETF is the most obvious choice because that's the most traded one. Uh, apart from that, I recently did a study on Nifty Junior. And I think it's also very, very interesting because coming five years, if you believe that India market is going to grow from you know three trillion to five trillion, all these junior Nifty stocks will do very well because finally they will become Nifty stocks, right? So combination of Nifty, Nifty Junior, and maybe a gold ETF to give you that comfort of currency depreciation as well as gold being an inflation hedge. Okay, so gold is the next topic. Uh, gold ETFs. Do you do you prefer gold ETFs to sovereign gold bonds? I mean, uh, your thoughts because there's physical gold as well, but yeah. people don't prefer physical gold anymore because of the security risk. You know, the making charges. So tell us, within gold, what should I look at for my child? Well, I think both have its own merits and demerits. I'm more of an ETF person. Uh, but the bottom line is we have to invest in gold. Maybe 4 to 5% of our exposure should be there in gold. Because gold is not just about gold. It's also about currency depreciation. Yeah. And we all have to understand this whole science of currency. I mean, it went up from 80 to 83, like, and people are doing foreign education, so it has really hit their pocket. Gold, if you would have invested, if you have done SIP for five years, you would have made 12% CAGR. Even if gold looks like on dollar terms is an underperformer, but in rupee term, gold has still given you 12% CAGR. Mm. So it could be a uh, souvenir bond, it could be an ETF. I'm more of an ETF person, so but there should be gold in your portfolio. Okay, so 4-5% of gold should be there in your portfolio yeah. to hedge against the currency move. Uh, and of course, inflation. I want to talk about Sukanya Samriddhi a little bit yeah. because a lot of people recommend that for the girl child. Yeah. I take it that it's tax free, it's safe, but I also feel like there are better options. I mean, why lock in your money for 21 years at 7%? You can look at Bharat Bond, corporate FDs, but your thoughts on Sukanya Samriddhi as an investment tool? You know, it's more mental. I know there are better, better financial instruments, but the moment you target that this is for my daughter, it becomes kind of a moral obligation for you that, oh, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole term of Sukanya Samriddhi yeah. that gives you so much of obligation to do it for your daughter. Mm -hmm. I can do it. I mean, I can get probably better return in there are many other instruments. Yeah. But this is like a, a yearly commitment you have given to your daughter that, mm -hmm. listen, I'm going to do it for you till you become 21. So I don't think so you should consider that to be a financial asset. Okay. It's more of a something which you want to do for your daughter. But you may need the money at 18, at 19. Is it 21 year lock-in? Don't you think that's not financially a prudent I mean, you can decide option? the capital. Yeah. No one is asking you to put large capital, right? Yeah. From 500 rupees to one and a half, you can do. So plan things. That's why I'm saying sell A1. Start from sell A1. So that you can plan that, okay, I'm okay to invest only 10,000 rupees a year. Hmm. So that you don't have to really question that 10,000 in future. Okay. Uh, so we've decided, we've, you know, sort of chalked out our entire strategy on how to plan for your children's future. But come Coming back to talking about money, right? Yeah. Uh, I wanted some tools for children. Uh, what are the kind of books that you would advise? How important is it to talk to your children about money? And what are the different resources that you can share with them? I think the best resources would be uh, internet and uh, uh, YouTube. There are so many book reviews. So get your student, uh, get, get your kid. Uh, get away from all those gaming YouTube channels and give them some interesting book review channels. And there are some books which I did mention. I mean, the standard books and the psychology of money and other. Make it more interesting, make it more fun for them. Otherwise, books are quite boring for younger generation these days because we are not reading anymore. We are comfortable watching videos. So start with book summaries. That's a good uh, option. Absolutely. Uh, so there's psychology of money. There's rich dad, poor dad. There's the richest man in Babylon. I've read two of them. Yeah. I haven't read richest man in Babylon just yeah. yet, but I've heard it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, there are, are there any other ways of introducing financial literacy to your child in the sense, uh, you know, you spoke about pocket money. You spoke yeah. about books. Uh, you spoke about uh, different tools on the internet. Uh, anything else that you'd propagate to, you know, start the concept early? I think let them earn money. That's very important. And uh, earning money can be from a very trivial things like every morning when you get up, you have to make your bed. And I'll give you certain points because you have done that. Mm. So every day they should have a balance sheet of their own that, oh, today I made so much money. But isn't there, there's a debate on that, yeah. right? I mean, you're yeah. incentivizing your child to do something that he should be doing anyway. Yeah. So isn't that counterproductive? Have you not heard the story of Krishna, right? <laughs> He wanted makhan, right? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the mother used to ask him, you do this thing, then I'll get it. This mm. is the most, most primitive way yeah. of motivating your kid, which mm. has been followed in our uh, rituals for many, many years. So 
I think we should not question that. Okay, <laughs> all right. So that's about children, right? But sometimes children are sorted. It's the adults who are most confused. Yeah. So for all the adult viewers watching you right now, and you have so many videos on YouTube about financial literacy, uh, what are the, uh, for beginners, I mean, this is a show that a lot of millennials, a lot of Gen Z watches as well. Mm. Uh, for beginners just getting into the market right now, what are your one, two, and three top to-do list for investing? Well, I think the most important is one has to understand this concept of compounding. It is, it is widely talked about, but it is least practiced. Mm. Really, really, it's a powerful thing. And if you have that in your mind, it works fantastic. Second thing is habit, the power of habit. Uh, uh, that consistency. Consistency is, is so important. In stock market, I've seen uh, as a full-time scalping trader to more of a passive trader and an active investor, I've seen the more you have capital, the lesser your risk appetite becomes in the other way around. People generally say that larger capital, your risk appetite is higher. No, that doesn't work that way. If you have more capital, you always have the you know, mindset of losing that large capital. So your, your bets in the market or your investment or your trading call in the market becomes much more wiser with a larger capital. So when you have smaller capital, uh, Think in a very different manner. And as your capital is growing, you have to change yourself. Mm. And market is changing every four year, five year, because the market microstructure changes. Mm. Thanks to regulator, thanks to the new technology, market is changing every three, four years. Mm. So your involvement in the market has to be in sync to the market. Otherwise, you will get disappeared. OK, well, those are some pearls of wisdom that are much needed, I guess, in today's day and age. Thanks a lot, Vivek. It was a pleasure uh, speaking to you. And uh, we have another episode coming up next week on, children, on our Children's Day special, a two-part series. So do stay tuned into that. Keep writing to us with your feedback. We love hearing from you. Thanks a lot for watching Smart Money.